This is Christmas Car Kerfuffle. Written by Jesse Gussman. Performed by Jay Dice. Chapter One Her car was gone. Blythe Mason looked at the dark blue sedan in front of her. Nope. It was similar to her car. Same color, same general shape, same make and model. But she peeked in the back window again. No booster seat. No coloring books on the floor. No backpacks, pencils, children's meal toys, or little trucks or dolls on the floor. Dread settled in her stomach as she fingered the key fob. It felt the same as hers, looked the same. But since this vehicle in front of her wasn't her car, the key fob could hardly be hers. She eyed the trunk, her heart pounding in her chest. Maybe Zayden, her brother-in-law, ex-brother-in-law, an owner of this auto repair shop, had cleaned out the interior of her car when he changed the oil and put the snow tires on. Maybe he'd forgotten to put the booster seat back in. If he had detailed the interior, it would be the first time in four years, since he'd started servicing her car for free. Swallowing, she double-pressed the button to open the trunk. Please let them be in there. She didn't close her eyes to pray, and the prayer wasn't even finished in her head when she knew it hadn't been answered. At least, not with anything other than a no, which seemed to be God's standard answer to her. Slamming the trunk shut, she clicked the lock on the key fob. Spinning on her heel, she marched down the sidewalk and back into the empty shop. Zayden's shop was always busy, but he had said he was planning on closing early this afternoon and staying closed through Christmas. He graciously agreed to do her car very last minute when she'd explained that her front tire kept going flat. He wouldn't charge her for the tires, nor for the oil change that he probably did. He would have checked everything else out, too. He always did. She didn't know anything about cars, and Zayden had a vested interest in keeping her safe, since he loved his niece and nephew and wouldn't want anything to happen to them. So she trusted him. Of course, she'd also trusted his brother, her ex-husband Ken, and that had been a major mistake. One that she'd put behind her. She needed the reminder. This time of year, being a single mom sucked more than any other. She wasn't even going down that rabbit trail. Right now, she needed to figure out what happened to her car. Her low heels clicked in the vast, empty interior as she crossed it, angling for the office door where Zayden's head was visible, bent over some papers on his desk, getting things in order before he left the shop for the Christmas break, probably. She tapped on the glass before opening the door. His eyes, a deeper, darker green than Ken's, widened when he looked up. He stood immediately. Is there a problem with your car? He asked, his brows knitted. Kind of. She tilted her head and tried not to notice the way his t-shirt strained over his chest. It's not mine. She almost smiled at the expressions that crossed his face. First, confusion. Then it became thoughtful, probably as he tried to figure out what had happened. Dawning shock. Horror. The last one scared her. His face scrunched up as though he knew the next few minutes were going to be painful. You're sure? It wasn't a question, but she answered anyway. Yes. He blew out a breath and lifted his cap to run his hand through his hair. Ken had always kept his neatly trimmed, but Zayden's had a tendency to grow long, like he couldn't remember to get it cut more than once every six months. I'll call Joe, but I'm pretty sure I know what happened. He picked up his phone, his brows drawn together. We had another car in here, same color and model as yours. 
It broke down in town, and the owner rented a car to get home to New York. Her sister lives here, though, and offered to drive the car to New York since she was going to be going up anyway for Christmas. His lip twisted in a small apology, and he raised his hand, palm up. She wouldn't have known it was the wrong car. His mouth flattened. Joe should have known better. Don't blame Joe, Blythe said quickly. Even though she had no idea what she was going to do about the fact that all the gifts, every single one, that she had bought for her kids were in the back of her car, which was, apparently, in New York, she didn't want Joe to get fired. I know he's a good mechanic, and he's always been so nice to me when I'm here. Joe was the type of man who didn't seem like he had a lot of book smarts, but he could fix just about anything. Well, in his defense, the woman who owns the car has a name very similar to yours. He probably didn't take the time to sound out the name, just grab the key under the name that looked right. Yes, I totally understand. However, I'm wondering how I'm going to get my car back. Well, the sister is coming back down here after Christmas. That's not going to work. She interrupted him. All of my children's Christmas gifts are in my car. My mother is actually watching my children, and I was planning on wrapping everything tonight. She trailed off, tears, unexpected, stinging her eyes. Why did nothing ever go the way she planned? She had intended to finish college but got married instead. She'd intended to be married forever, but Ken cheated. Christmas gifts might seem like a small thing in comparison, but this was her Christmas with her kids. They were with Ken last year, and he'd taken them to some big ski resort in Montana. If that's what he did for a six- and eight-year-old, who knew what his gifts in future years would be? She couldn't compete with him and his new wife, and she wasn't even going to try. But she had wanted to make Christmas magical all the same. Zayden's dark eyes studied her across the desk. He was taller than Ken and brought her in the shoulders. But the real difference was in their personalities. Guess I'm driving to New York this evening, then. His lips curved up. That's a pretty good hiding spot. I always looked under my mother's bed and in her closet. She blinked back the stinging in her eyes and forced her lips to curve up. <laughs> when they were younger, that worked. But Lottie found her birthday stash under my bed last year, and I had to up my game. He laughed, his eyes crinkling and his cheeks creasing in deep, well-worn lines. Lithe's heart stumbled and her eyes darted around the small but tidy office, landing on the neat desk. I hate to put you out so close to Christmas. You're the one being put out. He pushed the button on his phone. If he noticed her sudden uneasiness, he was too kind to say so. I need to call the other customer. Your car probably hasn't even arrived at her house. I think it's about four hours away. He clicked the screen a couple of times, then pulled the keypad up on his phone. Did someone drop you off? Yes, but my car was sitting outside, or I thought it was my car, and she left. That's fine. If it's okay with you, I can drop you off at your house. I have about five minutes here. I appreciate it. He put the phone to his ear, and she turned away, wandering back toward the door. If he went straight up and came straight back, that would be eight hours. She would still have time to wrap the gifts. She'd just have to do it early tomorrow morning instead of late tonight. Since the kids were staying the night at her mother's, that would work out. Hello? This is Zayden Krill, the mechanic. Yes, I bet you were just about to call me. I'm so sorry. Right. Of course. I was planning on bringing it up tonight. Great. Okay, I have your address and phone number. I can text you when we're close. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for understanding. No problem. Merry Christmas to you, too.
She watched in the door glass as he set the phone back on his desk. It's a go. He checked the time as she turned around. Four hours up, four back, and I'll have to take Grandpap with me, so give me an hour to stop and use the restroom a couple of times and defeat him once or twice. I should be back by midnight or one o'clock. Of course, it was the screw-up of his shop, and he should be working this out for her. But she couldn't help thinking that Ken would have found a way to blame her, or at the very least tell her since he was doing her car for free, she could go get it herself. But Zayden wasn't like that. Sure, he wasn't as serious and driven as Ken. He had an easier smile and a more laid-back way. Ten years ago, next to Ken, he had seemed immature. Now? Her stomach did a slow turn. Now, he was exactly what she'd be looking for if she were looking to start dating, which she wasn't. Except for one thing. Ken had told her years ago, when they'd first started dating, that Zayden was gay. Zayden watched Blythe walk out his office door. He still had a good mind to call Joe and ream him out, not that it would do any good. It would only hurt a good mechanic's feelings. No, he had to shoulder the blame for this himself. He'd wanted to ease the burden that Blythe carried. Ken had been a jerk to her. She didn't deserve it. Zayden couldn't fix Ken, but he could help out with Blythe's car and the occasional maintenance around her home. She didn't really go anywhere, but he watched her kids occasionally and had Rand, who was ten, helping in the shop on Saturdays. Paid him a little something. Picking up his phone again, he made a quick call to his grandpap about their change of plans for the evening. Grandpap loved car rides, and Zayden knew he wouldn't be turning this one down tonight. He promised to be ready to go. Over the years, Zayden had taken the kids camping and on other day trips, trying to step in to be a father figure to his nephew and niece. Blythe had even come on occasional trips like when he'd taken them to the amusement park this past summer. He had to be careful about trips like that, though. It was too easy for him to picture his brother's former family as his own. Blythe had never indicated that was something she was interested in. Ten years ago, she'd had her choice of either of them, and she'd chosen Ken. He'd buried his heart in his work and forced himself to stand down. She didn't want you, man. Ken had assured him that Blythe wasn't interested in blue-collar men. She was attracted to skilled professionals. Still, since the divorce, he'd tried to help her out. Like today. But apparently no good deed went unpunished. His whole body wanted to sink into the floor over the switched-out car, but he was doing all he could to fix the problem. After shutting down the computer and washing his hands in the small restroom off the side of his office, he strode out. He got to take her home, at least. Maybe that was God's little Christmas gift to him. You're smiling. Blythe stood by the side door of the shop, waiting. I don't usually have a beautiful woman waiting for me to get off work. Her mouth formed a circle before she dropped her eyes and fumbled with her purse strap. Stupid mouth. He'd tried hard to treat her like a sister. After all, he could hardly do fun things with her and her children if he caused her to want to avoid him because he scared her away with his true feelings. Grabbing the car keys from the rack inside the door, he took one last look around the shop to make sure everything was closed up before he hit the light switch and followed Blythe out the door. The dark blue sedan was parked in front of his pickup. Oh, Blythe stopped on the sidewalk. I could drive the car to your house so you'll have your pickup at home. Zayden scrambled to think of an excuse to keep her in the car with him. Nah, tonight when I get to your house, I'll walk home. His house was only a few doors down from what had been their family home growing up and where Ken and Blythe had set up their home after getting married. 
They planned on getting a bigger home after Ken had been in practice for a few years. Ken had, and he'd moved into it with his girlfriend. But your truck will still be here. I'll ride my Harley over tomorrow. I've been wanting to do a little winter maintenance on it anyway. She shrugged, and he figured she didn't care one way or the other whether they rode together for the five-minute drive home. It was hard on his heart, but not surprising. If it's okay with you, I'm going to stop and pick Pap up on my way through and grab a change of clothes. Sure, she winked at him. Actually, would you mind stopping and picking up my gram? She was going to help me wrap gifts, but there's no reason we can't still spend the evening together. She's at the senior care home a couple of blocks down from your house on Oak Street. He adjusted the route so they'd pull into the front of the facility. No problem. I'll give her a call and let her know we're on our way. Blythe punched some numbers into her phone and had a short conversation with her gram, a feisty old lady that Zayden had always liked the few times he'd been around her at family gatherings. Blythe ended the call and looked over at him. We'll have to get him and my gram together again. She's mentioned like a hundred times how much fun she had with him at the 4th of July when we all took a picnic and went to Ramey's Dam and watched the fireworks over the lake. Paps mentioned that at least as much. Zayden had his own good memories from it. He'd fed Blythe two s'mores because she said she loved them, but could never eat them without getting the marshmallows all over her. It had been too dark for her to see the heat in his eyes and the longing on his face. Hopefully. He opened her car door, and she reacted the way she always did, with a little jerk of surprise, then a beautiful smile. Thank you. His heart leaped. He breathed deeply as she slipped into the car. Her cinnamon vanilla scent flavored the air. His hand tightened on the door before he closed it. The driver's seat was too high and too far forward. He had to adjust it before he could squeeze in. Blythe laughed, and the sound sent waves of longing through his chest. It's not nice to laugh at your knight in shining armor. <laughs> it's okay when it's the knight's fault that I need a knight in shining armor in the first place. He shifted into drive and pulled out. You might have a point there. I really am sorry. She fingered her purse strap and looked out the window. I know. It's not like you did it on purpose. I wouldn't even be upset if I hadn't had the brilliant idea of hiding the kids' presents in there. Technically, I just made sure that your kids would definitely not find them. Her laugh filled the car and squeezed his heart. <laughs> I hadn't considered that. Does this mean you expect me to thank you? Maybe you don't have to go that far. It's not the first time I owe you a thank you. Rand just loves going to the garage to work on Saturdays, and I really appreciate you putting up with him. I'm not putting up with anything. He works for his money. Lottie's welcome to come down, too. Maybe when she gets a little older. Blythe sighed and looked out the window. She always wants to do everything Rand does, and it drives him crazy. This is Rand's thing. Zayden nodded, flipping on his turn signal. Blythe didn't say Rand wished his father had time for him, but she didn't have to. I knew when I married him that a doctor worked long hours. Zayden nodded. She hardly ever said anything bad about Ken. She'd mentioned once that she didn't want to badmouth her kid's father. But there was a lot to complain about. After all, Ken didn't work on Saturday or Sunday, and Blythe had mentioned to Zayden that their custody agreement gave him the right to every other weekend. He seldom took them. Figuring it might make Blythe feel better to know that Ken wasn't completely at fault, he said, Sherry complains if he works 60 or more hours a week, then spends the whole weekend with his kids. Her head twisted toward him. I thought that might be it but I've never heard her say anything. She mentioned it at Thanksgiving. Blythe's mouth dropped. 
Were the children around to hear? No. He'd been clearing off the table with his parents. It was after dinner and the kids were already in the room watching a movie with Grandpap. Her chest deflated and they sat in silence for the rest of the short ride. He pulled around the half-circle drive and parked in front of the sliding doors. She said she'd be waiting at the desk. They won't let her leave until I sign her out. I can't believe your Graham puts up with that. She hates it. I'd love to move her back in with me. But since Ken left, I work during the day. Her voice trailed off, and she got out of the car without saying another word. Anger, low and hot, twisted in his stomach. Blythe had worked while Ken was in med school, supporting them both. He'd promised in return that she'd be able to be a stay-at-home mom when he started practicing. Just another of his brother's lies. Zayden hopped out of the car when Blythe and her Graham emerged from the nursing home. Zayden Krill, you're high-stepping with my granddaughter again, you sly thing. Blythe's Graham pointed her cane at him and shook it, smiling like she actually missed him. It's good to see you again too, Graham, he said with a cautious glance at her cane, which pointed back at the ground like it was supposed to. You're looking good. Stop with the nonsense. I look like a 70-year-old old lady, and nothing you say is going to change it. Zayden met Blythe's laughing gaze with his brows raised. Okay, he said as he opened the back seat door. Now, if you really want to help me, you can tell me where that handsome grandfather of yours is. He hasn't called me since last week. Grandpap called her? Blythe's blank look and shrug said that she didn't know anything about it either. We're stopping at my house. You can ask him about it yourself. Zayden waited until she tucked her cane in before closing the door behind her. They did have a good time together on the fourth, Blythe said as she rounded the front of the car. But I didn't realize that it might be more than that. Never occurred to me either. It'd be good for Pap to have someone to talk to. He comes to the garage almost every day and talks to the customers, but I think he does that because he's lonely. We'll have to do some matchmaking after Christmas, Blythe said. Chapter Two They pulled up to Zayden's house, and Blythe unsnapped her seatbelt. Her Graham stopped chatting to take a breath, and Zayden took advantage of the small silence. You don't have to come in. I'll be out in five minutes, tops. You're driving the whole way to New York. Take an extra few minutes for a shower. Blythe paused with her hand on the latch. Unless you want us to wait. Oh, no, not at all. Come on in. Zayden didn't usually get flustered but his cheeks flushed and his fingers fumbled for the latch. Surely there wasn't a reason he didn't want her to come in. He was out of the car and had his hand on Graham's latch. This will give her and your pap a chance to chat too, she said as she came around the car. His bicep twitched under his t-shirt, which was all he wore despite the December chill. His lip curved up. I think you found your calling matchmaker. She laughed. Somehow Zayden could always tease her out of any bad mood. That definitely sounds more fun than administrative assistant, but it probably doesn't pay as well. Probably not. The fun jobs usually don't. He opened the door and offered his hand to her Graham. As Graham's translucent fingers gripped Zayden's straight, calloused ones, a flutter tickled her chest. He was always so careful of her children, mindful of their small size next to his strength. He didn't rush Graham, but stood with patience while she fussed with her cane and purse. In the twelve years she'd known him, he'd had very few girls around and no steady girlfriends. Maybe he didn't like girls. She narrowed her eyes at the broad shoulders. That was none of her business. She hustled over to Graham's other side and took Graham's elbow. 
Zayden helped them up the steps and opened the door, ushering them inside. The house was an old brick Victorian, and Blythe had never tired of looking at the original woodwork, pocket doors, and built-in bookcases. Zayden always had a repair project going, and often had Rand over on Sunday afternoons helping. Should have told me we were having guests. I'd have put some more soup in the pot. Zayden's grandpap stepped into the far doorway that led into the kitchen, a short, frilly, pink apron tied around his waist. With his coveralls and big black Velcro strap sneakers, he made an interesting sight, and Blythe's lips twitched. We're not staying, Grandpap. Actually, I was hoping you'd ride with me to New York. We gave Blythe's car to the wrong person at the shop, and I need to go get it. Graham looked at Blythe. Couldn't it wait until after Christmas? I'm sure these two are just as busy getting ready as anyone. It's okay, Graham. Don't give her any grief. It was my mistake. Plus, she really does need to have her car back. Zayden looked at Blythe. His deep green eyes sent a little thrill right to the spot that had fluttered earlier. Can you explain the rest to them? I'm heading up to grab a quick shower and get this grease off me. She nodded, and he went out through the arched doorway, taking the steps two at a time. Through the banister rail, she could see his strong legs, and a little thrill went through her. Sure, he'd messed up her car, or actually his mechanic had messed up her car, but Zayden took the blame and also the responsibility to fix the screw-up. He hadn't said one bad word about his mechanic, which she appreciated. Why are you making that poor man drive to New York on the day before Christmas Eve? Why not just make him pay to rent you a car and he can go get it sometime next week? Graham's slightly raspy voice cut through Blythe's thoughts. She turned, fingering her purse strap. All the gifts I bought Rand and Lottie are in the trunk of my car. Graham and Pap stared at her for several silent seconds. Grandpap broke the silence by hooting and slapping his leg. <laughs> that beats all. Well, Graham said drooly, guess they won't be finding them before Christmas. Still chuckling, Grandpap waved an arm at the comfortable blue couch and love seat in the formal living room. You ladies can have a seat for a few minutes. Zayden doesn't mess around when he's cleaning up, and he'll be right down, I'm sure. Thanks. Blythe stepped more fully into the room from the entry hall, looking around, admiring the beautiful architecture. It didn't look like two bachelors lived there, with the tasteful decor that included long flowing curtains in the oversized windows and a marble fireplace. The only thing that hinted at anything less than professional decor was the Christmas tree that blinked in the corner. A hodgepodge of ornaments randomly placed gave it a slightly lopsided look. One string of colored lights blinked, and one string, nearer the top, didn't. The angel at the pinnacle leaned slightly forward. I didn't think Zayden was much of a decorator. Blythe helped her gram settle into one end of the couch. Pap laughed as he hobbled over to the other end and eased down. <laughs> He's not. You know his mother. Oh, that's right. She'd forgotten Mrs. Creel was an interior decorator. Since the divorce, Mr. and Mrs. Creel hadn't had much to do with her or her children. In fact, even though the Creels lived in Amaranth, not far from her home, she didn't have any Christmas plans with them. <laughs> I'd forgotten, Blythe said. She noted the pictures on the fireplace mantel, one of Rand and one of Lottie, as she took a spot on the love seat. They were in plain frames and didn't seem to match the rest of the decor. Had Zayden put them there himself? As much as Zayden had done with her children since her divorce, she hadn't been in his home much, and she hadn't had many personal conversations with him. He was a great guy, always willing to help, and dependable. When he said he was picking them up, he was there. But as for his private life, she had never asked. A memory, 
Firelight and s'mores along with fireworks and cool evening air drifted through her head. He jokingly fed her s'mores when she said she couldn't eat them because she always made a mess on herself. For her, the world had narrowed to the two of them, and it had been all she could do not to lick his fingers and maybe nip them while she was at it. That evening, her whole mindset about Zayden had shifted, and as hard as she tried, she couldn't get it to shift back. Blythe took another glance around the room as she settled back in the comfortable seat. Grandpap and Graham seemed to exchange some kind of speaking glance, and Blythe smiled to herself. She could see those two getting together. Just because they were old didn't mean they couldn't fall in love. Even if there wasn't hope for Zayden and her, they would have to get together and work out some matchmaking plan for Grandpap and Graham. A mechanic magazine lay on the end table and she picked it up, pretending to be interested, just to give the older couple a measure of privacy if they wanted to make eyes at each other. Grandpap and Graham talked about the new senior center while Blythe listened with half an ear. Less than ten minutes went by before Zayden came down the stairs behind her. She stood as he came in the room. His cowboy boots clicked on the hardwood floor. Can I talk to you in the kitchen for a minute? He asked. She nodded while he told the older couple they'd be just a minute. She walked behind him through the formal dining room and into the kitchen, admiring the way his dark blue plaid button-up stretched across his shoulders narrowing where his leather belt emphasized the narrowness of his waist and hips. His crisp blue jeans emphasized his strong thighs and legs. Blythe shifted her gaze to the dark walnut hardwood floor. She'd seen him dressed like this before. It was pretty much his standard dress when he wasn't in his old t-shirt and black jeans he wore in the shop. He waited until she followed him into the kitchen and closed the door carefully behind him. Two coffee cups and a plate sat in the sink waiting to be washed, but the counters were cleared and the island with four bar stools was tidy. Only a stack of mail sat on one edge. The stools were pushed neatly under the top overhang. Zayden gave her a sheepish smile. I don't want to be presumptuous about your gram, but we were just talking about her and my pap. He trailed off and ran a hand through his still wet hair, ruffling it. She never noticed that it was slightly curly, but it wasn't usually this long, curling out over his ears and the nape of his neck. Maybe he caught her look because he shrugged. I need a cut, but I'm going to have to wait until after Christmas now. I could do it. She clamped her mouth shut. Where had that come from? You cut hair? I always cut my dad's and my brother's. She lifted a shoulder, although a little longing went through her that she wasn't going to see her family for Christmas. It saved money when I was growing up. I cut Rand's now just because he hates sitting in the chair. I'd love it if you would, but I don't want to put you out. It's the least I can do after all you do for my kids. They're my niece and nephew. I want to spend time with them. He probably spent more time with them than their own father did, but she wasn't going to go there. I was just thinking upstairs that it might be a good opportunity today to have your Graham go with Grandpap and me to New York. I promise I'll take care of her. He added quickly when her face scrunched up. I know you will, she assured him immediately. I just hate to put you out even more than you already are. It's not a huge deal. Grandpap is already going with me. He doesn't really have a choice unless he wants to sit here by himself all evening. He could come to my house, she heard herself say. But, hey, why not? It wasn't like she had plans. Not anymore. Would that be better than me taking them with me? He asked, his voice low, his green eyes searching her face. She looked away suddenly uncomfortable with their closeness and her reactions to him. He'd been a great uncle and a good friend. If she started getting weird on him, she could lose it all. It's up to you. You might end up stopping a lot with two older people in the car. 
I don't mind. It's not like there's a race to get back. What a difference from Ken, who saw everything as a race or a competition. She opened her mouth to say that was fine, but snapped it closed with his next words. You could go too. Her mouth dropped. He shifted his feet and a flush crept up his neck. I mean, I'm sure you have better things to do this close to Christmas, and I've already put you out enough with losing your car to begin with. I appreciate you taking responsibility for it, but we both know it wasn't your fault. He just asked her to go to New York with him? She hadn't misheard? She could hardly believe it and frantically searched her brain to try to figure out if he were just trying to keep her from being alone this evening, since he already knew her mother had her kids. Or did he really want her? He shoved his hands in his pockets. It's my business. I can't always control what my employees do, but I have to shoulder the blame. If he'd forgotten to put the oil cap back on and your car had blown up 50 miles down the road, that would be my baby too. Not everyone thinks that way. He shrugged like it wasn't any big deal. Maybe he regretted his offer since he didn't repeat it. The silence stretched between them. He put his hand on the door, ready to walk out. Well, maybe she won't be interested. Let's go see what they say. She nodded and they walked back out, her chest swirling with disappointment. Zayden could have kicked himself for his offer to take Blythe with him. Why in the world would she want to take a worthless trip to New York to fix the mix-up her mechanic-slash-brother-in-law had made? He loved spending time with Rand and Lottie and loved that seeing his niece and nephew also meant he got to see Blythe. But she obviously didn't have the same feelings for him that he had for her and if he wanted to keep their relationship from being awkward, he needed to keep his mouth from running off when it should really stay shut. Like just now. Halfway through his formal dining room, he could see Grandpap and Graham on the couch together. They were situated in the middle of it, rather than on each end the way they were when he'd walked out. Their heads leaned together, and they seemed like they were in deep conversation about something. He glanced at Blythe and nodded to the old couple. She grinned and gave him a cheesy thumbs up. He stumbled, the ache in his chest sharper than it ever had been before. Her beautiful smile pulling his own lips up, even while his heart hurt. Jerking his gaze away, he cleared his throat. Hey, I'm ready. He came around the front of the couch and hunched down in front of Graham. I was wondering if you want to go with Grandpap and I? Funny you should mention that, son. She slanted a look at Grandpap out of the corner of her glasses. I was just thinking that I'd love to go, but I wanted to spend some time with Blythe, too. So, she turned and watched as Blythe walked around and stood beside Zayden. I figured I'd ask Blythe if she wanted to ride along to New York and back. The four of us could go together, Grandpap added, just in case Zayden didn't get it the first time, apparently. The sly looks the older couple were sending to each other raised his radar, but he couldn't figure out their code speak. He looked at Blythe. I already asked her if she wanted to come, but I think she forgot to answer. He wanted to give her an out in case she really didn't want to. This is a busy time of year. She probably has a ton of things to do. She was going to wrap gifts tonight, with me, Graham insisted. That's impossible, so that means she's free. Zayden stood. He was about to open his mouth to help Blythe back out gracefully when her next sentence shot that idea to pieces. I'd actually love to go. What a great idea. A Christmas road trip with grandparents. Everything happens for a reason, even this Christmas car kerfuffle. Pap used his cane and eased himself up. I need to stop at the little boy's room, then I'll be ready. 
show me where it is, because I need to use it too, Graham said as Blythe helped her to her feet. They toddled off together to the hall bathroom. Do you mind still stopping at my house? I'd like to change into something more suited to a road trip than this. Blythe indicated her outfit, a business skirt suit and heels. And I'd like to grab something to munch on. Of course I'll stop. And don't worry about food. We'll stop somewhere and grab a bite. Satan could hardly believe he was going to get to spend the next eight hours with Blythe. He just had to maneuver the seating arrangements. He checked the doorway where the older couple had disappeared. You think we can manage to get them in the back seat together? She grinned. You handle Grandpap, and I'll get Graham. We just won't give them a choice. Turned out it was needless worrying, since both Graham and Grandpap expressed a desire to ride in the back seat. Which was a little odd, because Zayden had never heard Grandpap say that he got a little dizzy riding in the front, and when Graham had claimed that the front seat made her hip replacement hurt, Blythe's face had registered surprise like she hadn't known. They stopped for a few short minutes at Blythe's house. She ran in looking like a successful businesswoman. She came back out looking better than Christmas cookies with icing. Soft, worn blue jeans, boots, and a light green sweater gave her a casual look that made it hard for him to take his eyes off her. She carried a coat in her purse. He swallowed as she got back in and tried to act like she wasn't the most beautiful woman in the world. They were out on the highway, taking I-99 to I-80, when Blythe suggested Christmas carols. If you can stand my braying, I've never been much of a singer. He loved singing, but he usually confined it to the shower and church. That's okay. My sister always said I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket, Grandpap said from the back seat. I guess you take after me. Blythe got the music up on her phone, which was already synced to the car radio, and rocking around the Christmas tree came out in full stereo. Graham and Grandpap had no problems getting into the music from the back seat. I think they'd be dancing right now if we were home. Zayden said, his fingers tapping on the wheel. I know they would be, Blythe's eyes twinkled. I'd be wanting to, too. He could live with that. He'd never been a big fan of dancing, always more comfortable with a tool of some kind in his hand, but heck yeah, he'd dance if it meant holding Blythe. I'll hold you to that when we stop to eat. <laughs> no one dances at restaurants anymore. We can't let Graham and Grandpap be the only ones. Gotta take one for the team. He slanted his gaze over at her. The humorous gleam in her eye and the upturn of her lips said she could get into the matchmaking holiday spirit. The chorus came on and he sang along. If he had a chance to be more than friends with Blythe, his lack of any type of singing ability was not going to make a difference. They laughed as their wrong notes struck discordantly with the music pumping through the car stereo. And as the next few songs came on, the four voices in the car almost drowned it out completely. White Christmas came on, slower, in a deep baritone, and Blythe's laughter faded. She grew quiet. Don't know this one? Zayden asked checking the back seat where Graham hummed along and Grandpap softly sang. We used to watch this movie every year. It was a tradition, I guess. Just makes me nostalgic. By we, he figured she meant Ken and her, and the happy bubble in his chest burst. Obviously, despite the divorce and the years that had passed, she still had feelings for his brother. I'd skip it, but it is one of Graham's favorites. She bit her lip and looked away, but not before he saw the one little tear in her eye. Hey. He touched the back of her hand where it lay on her lap with the tips of his fingers, meaning to give her a soft stroke of comfort. His fingers tingled and his heart shook as her body froze, 
and her gaze snapped to his. Her eyes were big. He could almost see the question marks in them. But she didn't move her hand away. He looked back at the highway. Just wanted to say it's okay to miss the things we used to have. She looked down at their hands, his work-worn and rough, big, hers smooth with delicate blue veins under her translucent skin, soft. Her throat moved. When Ken left, there was a big hole in our lives. She sighed deeply. I know you've tried your best to fill it. He felt like she was telling him he could never take Ken's place. His heart thumped painfully, and his jaw clenched. But her hand twisted under his, and just as he was getting ready to pull his hand away, her fingers intertwined with his. Thank you, she whispered. White Christmas ended, and the car was once again filled with Christmas singing. He was going around a sweeping curve just before their exit when brake lights Lots of them came into view. He hit his own brakes, hard. Traffic came to a standstill, and the festive atmosphere in the car seemed to still along with it. Is it an accident? Graham asked from the back. I can't tell, Zayden said, watching his rearview mirror closely. Not that there was anywhere to go if the 18-wheeler behind them didn't get hoed down in time. It stopped, thankfully, and Zayden relaxed a little. Blythe's hand still held on to his. He wasn't sure, exactly, what that meant. Especially after the statement that she'd uttered before she took it. But he supposed, like a beggar, he'd take what he could get, and tried not to question it too closely. Blythe relished the feel of the strong hand holding her own. Ken's hands had been soft. It didn't take a lot of strength to be a good doctor. And he was a good doctor, who cared about his patients and truly tried to do the best he could for them. She couldn't fault him there. Too bad he hadn't wanted to do that with his family. Would Zayden be the same? Suddenly an idea came to her, and she didn't think about it too much before she turned in her seat and said, Tell me a funny story about Zayden, Grandpap. Whoa, Zayden said. That is not the slightest bit fair. There are four of us in this car, and I'm the one that gets picked on? Just relax, son. I'll give you a good one about Blythe when we're done. I have just the story, Grandpap said, and Blythe realized he didn't have a clue that she just wanted to learn more about Zayden. He was actually going to enjoy talking about his grandson. Zayden had a pet rat when he was a teenager. No, not the rat story. Zayden put his forehead on the steering wheel. Good thing we're stopped, Blythe said under her breath. I wouldn't do this while I was driving, but trust me, you do not want to hear this story. Stop being so dramatic, Grandpap said. There's really not much to it. He had this white rat, and he took it out of its cage, and it got loose in the house. Ugh, that's awful, Blythe shivered. That's exactly what my mom thought. Honestly, I don't have rats anymore. Zayden lifted a brow at her as she squeezed his hand to let him know that she didn't hold it against him. This was back when people wore pants with enough room to breathe in. Not the tight things they wear now. They're called skinny jeans, Grandpap, Graham said with a little tap on his knee. His hand came down and caught hers, and their fingers entwined together. Blythe squeezed Zayden's hand and gave a little nod to the back. His brow scrunched down before he saw their clasped hands. His lips tilted, and he nodded at their hands, like they'd set the example and Grandpap and Graham had followed. We had a sweeper salesman show up at our house, and he just wouldn't leave. He managed to get himself to the living room, and he stood there talking like he belonged there. Well, that old rat of Zayden's must have decided that there stood a better hiding place than the one he currently had.
and he tore out from under the couch and trucked up that salesman's leg. Grandpap chuckled. <laughs> You'd have thought his pants were on fire. He tore out of the house, down the walk, and across the street, yipping and slapping at his leg. Grandpap rubbed his mustache. I always kind of felt sorry for that rat. He skedaddled out somewhere between the sidewalk and the corner of the old church where the salesman had parked and took off like he had the devil on his tail. Probably figured he did. Yep. Well, we never saw him again. The rat or the salesman? <laughs> Both. Grandpap chuckled. I lost my pet. You weren't that attached to it. <laughs> You're just trying to milk it out for the sympathy, Blythe accused, squeezing his hand. He shrugged, busted. So, Graham, it's your turn. Tell us Blythe's funny story. Well, Graham said slyly, I'll say this, Blythe talks in her sleep. Blythe gave a self-conscious laugh and nodded. That's true. Everyone who slept near me any time has said that at one point or another, I've talked in my sleep. Lots of people talk in their sleep. You have to do better than that, Graham. Zayden looked out at the long line of traffic. It looks like we're finally moving. Good, I'm hungry, Grandpap said. Me too, Graham agreed. But I wasn't finished with my story. There is a certain gentleman's name that Blythe has been saying in her sleep for the last three years or so. What? Blythe exclaimed, her eyes big. No one has said a word about that to me. Nope, Lottie told me about it. Blythe deflated like a tire with a big nail in it. Oh. Lottie had spent more than one night in her bed because of night terrors. Now, I don't want to embarrass anyone, but the gentleman you've mentioned, he's here. Graham! Her face had to be fire engine red. She tried to pull her hand away to cup her cheeks, but Zayden wouldn't let go. She thought she saw a smirk on his face, but when he turned to her fully, a pleased grin settled on his lips. That's a good story, he said. He reached over with his left hand and put the car in drive. Their eyes met. His with a little male pride in them. Hers probably showed her humiliation. She looked away quickly. We get off the next exit anyway, and I'm going to stop at the first place for gas. Hopefully there's a restaurant around too. He chuckled a little as the line of cars started moving. I didn't want to say anything. But the gas light came on, and I was really hoping we wouldn't be sitting there long. Blythe appreciated the subject change and his normal chatter. It helped her cover up her embarrassment. She had not known that she'd called out his name in her sleep. But she believed it. Not only did she talk in her sleep, but she'd had a few dreams where Zayden had figured prominently. So it stood to reason that she'd have said his name. She just hoped she hadn't said anything else embarrassing. Not in front of Lottie, and nothing that Graham would repeat. Zayden's thumb brushed over the sensitive inside of her wrist. She kept her eyes averted, pretending not to notice and to be extremely interested in the leafless trees that populated the side of the road. They pulled off the exit and into a truck stop restaurant. Let's eat first, then I'll gas up afterwards. That sounded good to everyone, and they parked close to the restaurant door. Zayden reached across again to put the shifter in park. She still couldn't quite bring herself to meet his gaze. His thumb slid across her palm before she pulled her hand from his and got out. Christmas music played in the background as they perused their menus and ordered. Blythe slouched farther down in her seat as the waitress walked away after taking their orders and rocking around the Christmas tree came on. I think it's a sign, Blythe, Zayden said, standing up with his hand out. He glanced at the two older people. She promised me a dance. 
She really hadn't promised, but she took his hand, aware that their true purpose, matchmaking with Grandpap and Graham, was at stake. If they started dancing, chances were that Grandpap and Graham would too. Sure enough, Grandpap said, Scoot out so I can dance too. He lowered his bushy brows at Graham across the table. You'll dance with me? Graham put a hand to her heart and giggled. Of course. Blythe smiled, following Zayden to a side aisle and placing her hands on his broad shoulders when he turned around. They were hard, solid. Her fingers gripped tighter and there was no give under them. She swallowed against the jumping of her heart. This place isn't really made for dancing, but at least it's not busy. Zayden put his hands on her waist. Did he feel the shiver that went through her torso? She glanced around, hoping her rioting insides would settle. Yeah. One of the waitresses standing with a co-worker over by the small salad buffet smiled and pointed. I don't think they mind. They actually look like they think it's sweet. Grandpap and Graham do look sweet together. He nodded over at them. Blythe swiveled her head the other way. Sure enough, Graham and Grandpap were jazzing it up. He took her hand and twirled her around. Graham laughed like a schoolgirl. Even if they don't fall in love, I think it's safe to say they're having a good time. He snorted. <laughs> Worth the sacrifice of dancing with me in the middle of a truck stop diner? She looked up at him. It's not a sacrifice. Eh, you didn't look super thrilled. He shrugged, muscle and sinew moving under her hand in the most intriguing way. I'm sorry. I guess I must be thinking about Christmas and all the gifts I have to wrap. I'm sorry about that. The song ended and a slower song came on. Please don't apologize again. It wasn't your fault to begin with and you've gone out of your way to make it right. She glanced over at Grandpap and Graham. They had moved closer and were slowly swaying to chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Zayden followed her gaze. He looked back at her and lifted his brows, slowly moving closer. His hand slid around her waist. Her fingers wandered over his shoulders and around his back, softly touching the longer, curled ends of his hair. There was no mistaking the shudder that tore through his body. Good or bad? She wasn't sure. Maybe revulsion, since Ken had said he liked men. But the way his eyes darkened, and the way his hands cradled her back, didn't really seem like revulsion. She bit her lip and turned her head. Ran seems to like coming to the garage. Zayden's tone was neutral. Oh, he does. He's so full of stories when he gets home, not only about the work he's done, but also about the people he's seen and the customers and their cars and problems. Her voice trailed off. She was so happy that Zayden had allowed Rand to help out. Of course, Ken hadn't been happy to hear of it. Zayden's thumb skimmed lightly along her back. Her entire back heated. Her fingers curled behind his neck. His eyes caught hers and her lungs froze. When had Zayden started looking at her the way a starving man looks at his last meal? She jerked away, knowing she had to be imagining it. Ken had insisted more than once that Zayden was gay. Blythe had never outright asked Zayden about it. After all, it was his own business and the subject hadn't exactly come up in the casual conversation she'd had with him. But in all the years that she'd been with Ken, she'd never seen Zayden with a girlfriend. He let go and she stumbled back, her hand on the sudden flutter in her stomach. What was wrong with her? She glanced around at the almost empty restaurant, the glittery decorations hanging from the ceiling and the big pictures that were covered in wrapping paper for the season. All the waitresses wore green shirts and red elves caps. A country Christmas song began pouring from the speakers, 
complete with violins and guitars. It had to be the season. Christmas was beautiful, magical, and romantic with the right partner. During their early years, Ken and she had spent many enchanted evenings together. Unfortunately, Ken had apparently decided she was replaceable. Sometimes she struggled not to be bitter. Are you okay? Zayden asked, his face showing nothing but concern. Fine, she said, and wanted to mean it. But a streak of loneliness the size of the Mississippi at flood stage had cut through her chest, and she worked to fight it off. Hey, you two, our food's here, Grandpap said as he led Graham back to their table. They scooted into one side of their booth, rather than facing each other as they had originally, directing the waitress where to place their plates. Blythe didn't even look at Zayden, but slid the whole way to the wall on the opposite side. After all, they were trying to push Graham and Grandpap together. It seemed like it was working, if their sidelong glances and whispering and laughing were any indication. This is yours. The waitress, Heather, sat around chops of gum. And this, she gave Zayden an extra big smile, is yours. She winked. Thanks, Zayden said, ignoring the obvious flirting. You folks need anything else? Heather asked, gathering up her tray and stand. They declined and began to eat. Did Blythe notice his hand shaking? That his spoon clattered against his bowl of beef stew? Satan wasn't sure, but he could hardly believe she missed it. His whole body tingled from holding her that short amount of time. He understood now why people might say they could have danced all night. With Blythe, all night would feel like mere minutes. But she had backed away as soon as he tried to pull her closer. And he let her go. Of course, like he could have done anything else. It had been hard. His hand had wanted to tighten and pull her even closer, fit her body to his tuck her head under his chin and allow his hands to glide down her curves. All very dangerous thoughts to be having about his brother's ex-wife. Apparently, she'd known it too, since she had smartly distanced herself from him, no less than what he deserved. His grip tightened on the wheel like he'd wanted to tighten on her. She'd smiled at him, and his heart couldn't help but want to believe that it was because she liked him. Maybe she did, as a brother. Pulling the car up to the front of the store after filling it up at the gas pump beside the restaurant, he hopped out. He needed to pull himself together before they came out. It was bad enough that the attraction he'd felt for Blythe, that he'd hidden for years, apparently morphed into a full-fledged schoolboy crush. He didn't need to start acting like a schoolboy to top it all off. Hopping out of the car, he let the keys sit on the console. He didn't want to lock it and keep everyone out of it until he used the restroom and bought a water. No one would steal a car that was parked in front of the store. Five minutes later, he paid for his water and walked out. I think someone stole our car. Blythe had her bottom lip pulled in between her teeth and it took all of two seconds to rip his eyes away from that side and actually hear what she said. His glance shot up to the stall he'd parked in, right in front, just next to the handicap spot. Empty. His stomach dropped. Pab said you parked it right here? She asked, her brows raised hopefully like she thought there was a chance Grandpap was wrong. He nodded slowly, still shocked. He saw you out the window, but we were in line behind a little boy who was paying with pennies, and it took forever. Graham leaned on her cane. I offered to give him two dollars just to speed it up, but he said his mother told him to use them because she wanted rid of them. Or she wanted a distraction. Although, how would anyone have known that he left the keys in the car and also had enough time to cause a distraction? 
Satan blew a breath out. It fogged white in the cold air. The temps had definitely fallen below freezing. Two cars in one day. He'd never heard of a shop losing their state license because of a mix-up like he'd had with Blythe's car. But he wouldn't be getting out of this unscathed, no doubt. I'd better call the police. He looked around. Where's Grandpap? He said he was going to walk around the building and look in the back. A flake of snow drifted by his nose. For the first time in an hour, he looked up at the sky. Dark, lowering clouds. Snow clouds. There had been no snow in the forecast in Pennsylvania, but I-80 was often the snow-rain line, and they were well above, and going farther north. Was it supposed to snow? He reached in his pocket for his phone. Not back home, Blythe said, patting her side, then looking around. Zayden's hand dug in his back pocket. His empty back pocket. I left my phone in the console of the car. Blythe's eyes widened and her hand froze against her side. I left my purse in the car. Chapter 3 Zayden felt like he'd been knocked down by a boulder. Not only had he lost Blythe's car, but now he'd managed to lose the other car and her purse, plus his phone, he felt his other back pocket, and his wallet. This is really shaping up to be about the worst Christmas I've ever had. He spun on his heel, touching Graham's elbow. Come on back in the store with me. He lifted his eyes and looked over Blythe's head, too ashamed to meet her gaze. It had been years, if ever since he'd been this irresponsible. I'll need to use their phone, and you might as well wait in here where it's warm. Hey, Blythe touched his arm. Her eyes were soft, and her head tilted to one side. It's okay. You just had your purse stolen. It's two days before Christmas. It's not okay. He clenched his fist wishing he could punch a wall a few times before he had to call and report his car, which was not his car, stolen. That might be an interesting thing to try to explain to the police. Blythe stepped closer. Her sweetly subtle scent drifted past his nose like the slowly falling snow. It is okay. Her hand came up and touched his cheek a soft caress that he felt in every pore of his body. Whether we get our stuff back or not, we're all safe. No one was hurt and we're still together. Her words hung in the air. They were together. Her eyes crinkled. Now, I think we really need to make that call. The faster we act, the better chance we have of getting the car back. Hey, boy. Zayden looked over at Grandpap, who was coming around the building. Blythe's hand dropped from his cheek, and the cold seemed more intense. Grandpap, let's go in where it's warm. Why don't we get in the car? Grandpap's face broke out in a grin. You look like you've been poleaxed, boy. The car was stolen. Nah, somebody just took it for a joyride and parked it out back. Zayden narrowed his eyes at Grandpap. Do you have any idea who might have taken it? Nope. All I know is I found it parked behind the building. He gave a slight bow and offered his arm to Graham. Can I escort Milady to her chariot? Graham put her hand to her chest. You're so romantic. She narrowed her eyes at Zayden, then nudged him with her elbow. You've lost her car and her purse. The least you can do is offer her your arm. Satan gritted his teeth. He wasn't completely convinced. He offered Blythe his arm, then waited for Graham and Grandpap to move ahead of them before leaning over to whisper in Blythe's ear. Did you get the feeling that Grandpap had something to do with the missing car? She looked up, her eyes twinkling. 
I got the feeling that something fishy was going on. She pursed her lips. Do you suppose they caught on to us playing matchmaker and decided a little revenge was in order? Zayden laughed softly. <laughs> I hadn't considered that at all. Were we too obvious? I think we were. They're old, not stupid. It backfired for him anyway. More than drawing Graham and Grandpap together, his little play-acting with Blythe had struck a torch to his slow-burning attraction. They do look good together, though, Blythe said as they rounded the corner. Sure enough, the car was pulled into the far back corner of the lot. They do. Zayden held his hand out, calloused palm up. Big, fat flakes fell into his hand, quickly melting into little pools of water. I wonder how much of this white stuff we're supposed to get. I'll look on my phone when we get to the car. Unless Grandpap decided to take that on a joyride, too. She snorted. Then, maybe she shouldn't have, but she pulled him to a stop. With a last glance at Grandpap and Graham, who had their backs toward them, she faced Zayden's confused look. I appreciate the fact that you didn't get all upset. I know men who would have thrown a fit just now and would still be angry, taking it out on whomever was near. His lips flattened, but he kept them closed when she held one finger up. Wait, I have more to say. She swallowed. I would kiss you right now, out of gratitude for not ruining our trip. But Ken always said that you preferred men. Whatever, I just want you to know. What? Zayden said incredulously. I prefer men. He shook his head and looked off for a moment before looking back. Like, I'm gay? She could only look at him and nod. The anger that had been so missing just moments ago now colored his face red and caused a vein in his temple to bulge. Her stomach cartwheeled. She should have kept her mouth shut. Zayden couldn't believe his brother could have been so nasty. And why? What good would it have served him to have lied to Blythe? When did Ken say that about me? She scrunched her nose up in that cute way she had, and some of his anger eased. He always did. She shrugged. It's what he always said. Before we started even dating, probably. He was a couple of years younger than Blythe, who was at least three years younger than Ken. Had Ken wanted to take out the competition? Not that an 18-year-old would have been appealing to a 21-year-old, especially a 21-year-old who had a doctor interested in her. If you're keeping it a secret, I want you to know I've never told anyone. Anger, like an overheated radiator, steamed up from his lungs. But a new dawning teased the edge of his brain, along with a hope. Maybe Blythe had never seemed interested in him because she assumed he wasn't interested in her. Anger had never helped him, ever, in his life, and he pushed it aside now. He stepped closer to Blythe and boldly slid a hand around her neck, under her hair. Tell me more about this kiss you were going to give me if I weren't gay. She laughed, but it sounded choked. Uh, I was just saying, I appreciate you not being angry. Her eyes darkened as his head lowered. Her voice became a whisper. Sometimes I say dumb things. He paused, his lips mere inches from hers. Her heart beat like the pistons on a two-stroke against his hand. She trembled. So you don't want to kiss me? He meant his question to be a gentle, sweet one, but it came out low and harsh. Her eyes widened, his thumb stroked along her cheek. Her body pressed toward him. I do, but you wouldn't enjoy it if you were gay. He growled. I'm not gay. His head lowered and he captured her lips with his. 
Fire leaped up between them like ignition fluid sprayed on a motor. A surprise sound escaped her lips before both hands reached up and grabbed his head, pulling him closer. His entire body shook, and he braced his legs, pulling her closer, tucking her into him. Hot and cold raced down his backbone as her mouth opened under his. He hadn't meant to ravish her mouth in the parking lot, hadn't exactly thought about anything beyond wanting her to know he wasn't what Ken said. Wasn't anything like what Ken said. But once he touched her, tasted her, he stopped thinking completely and only felt, savored, treasured this moment that he finally learned her taste, beauty and grace and raspberries. He'd never tasted such a combination before and couldn't get enough. Relishing the feeling of her tugging on his too long hair before she slid her fingers up into it, caressing his skull, he had a fleeting thought that maybe his hair wasn't too long after all, not if Bly's fingers could make his toes curl by threading through it. He pulled in his lower stomach. He vaguely heard a cat whistle. Reluctantly, he lifted his head. A cloud of white fog from their frozen breath surrounded their heads as he rested his cheek against hers, her softness against his stubble. How long had he dreamed about this? So, Blythe's voice came out soft and low. Was that a Blythe I'm not gay kiss? He smiled against her cheek, knowing immediately what he would say, and not sure how she would react but it seemed like a good time. His stomach cramped. No, that was a blithe, I've wanted to do this forever, and it was even better than I thought it would be, kiss. He allowed the sentence to hang between them, felt the slight stiffening of her body as she absorbed what he was saying, felt her drawing back and tried to stifle the knife of disappointment that cut through him. Her hands dropped from his hair, and she stepped back. He allowed her to go, of course, loosening his hands from around her waist and letting them fall to his sides. He felt empty and more vulnerable than he'd ever felt in his life. After all, he'd just given words to the biggest secret he'd carried for almost ten years. He was in love with his brother's ex-wife. She tilted her head. How long is forever. He wasn't backing down now. Only a coward would walk away at this point. Since I first saw you. That was ten years ago. He kept his mouth shut and met her gaze steadily. You've wanted to kiss me since you first saw me ten years ago? A car horn blared in the distance. Zayden didn't move his head. But Blythe looked. One lip pulled back. Grandpap is getting impatient. Let him. He's the one who thought it would be funny to hide the car. And Zayden would have to thank him later. He'd finally gotten the kiss he'd been dreaming of. Forget his earlier thoughts of a wretched Christmas. This was the best Christmas ever, even if he did get his gift two days early. So you're going to answer me? So you're going to peel me open, take out all my inside parts and examine them, but what's in here remains a mystery? He touched just below her collarbone lightly with his finger. What's in there is very confused right now. A snowflake landed on the tip of her nose. He touched it with his finger before forcing his hand to drop again. That's fair. He nodded his head looking at the car before his gaze returned to her. He'd still answer her question about how long he'd wanted to kiss her the only way he could, with the truth. He hooked a hand behind his neck before staring into her soft brown eyes, feeling like his very soul was exposed. Yeah, since the first time I saw you. He took a risk, one of many he was taking today, apparently and grabbed her hand. Come on, you need your car, and if we don't get going soon, Graham's going to have to go back in and use the restroom again. 
She laughed, leaving her hand in his and following him easily. Good signs to his way of thinking. Chapter 4 The snow was falling more heavily. The windshield wipers were on a steady back and forth to keep the view of the snow-covered State Route 99 and 15 clear. Still, Blythe's attention was so much more focused on the man beside her. He kissed her. Wow, an amazing kiss. Hot. She wouldn't have expected the heat from Zayden, who was about as steady of a man as there ever was. Ken was serious with a hot temper. Zayden always had an easy smile and a relaxed way of doing things. Even today, when the car mix-up had occurred, he'd not gotten flustered. Even when he thought the car was stolen, he'd stayed calm. It was a trait she admired deeply. She didn't touch her lips, although they still tingled, even now that it had been almost an hour since he'd kissed her. He hadn't said much of anything, seeming to act like the ball was in her court now, which she supposed it was. He'd said he'd wanted to kiss her. She'd said she was confused. It was up to her to correct the misinformation. She wasn't confused, not about Zayden and what she felt. She just wasn't sure how that would all look. To his parents, to hers, to everyone. Like she was replacing one brother with the other. The one she should have chosen to begin with. Ken had been smoother, more mature. A doctor, for goodness sake. And Zayden had been comfortable. A little immature to her since she was a woman of the world and he was just a recent high school grad. She should have looked deeper. The snow lay in thick white lines on the road. He drove with confidence. Not too fast, but he didn't creep along either, passing the more cautious drivers in the right-hand lane. That would be her. The steep, mountainous drop-offs were numerous along the way and she didn't trust the flimsy-looking guardrails to keep them clinging to the side of the mountains. But she did trust Zayden. He goofed and spun a donut in the back parking lot before pulling out of the restaurant, making Grandpap hoot with glee from the back seat, but he'd had a steady hand since. Currently, he had one hand on the wheel and one resting on the shifter between them. She studied it the fingers long but blunt-ended, calloused on the sides. Black grease stuck under the nails, which she knew from experience with Rand would only come out if she scrubbed with a stiff bristled brush or cut it out. Either way was painful for a small boy. A man would probably find it equally unpleasant. Zayden hadn't had enough time to scrub his nails today, though. A thick wrist, Bones and sinews moving under a dark tan, fanned out into a muscular forearm. He wore a t-shirt, having taken his long sleeve tee off and stuffed it under his seat so he wouldn't be too hot with the heater on. She appreciated the consideration, since she was still in her winter jacket. Although her neck heated under her collar at the thought of his hands and how carefully they'd held her. How capable they were. They were about an hour away from the restaurant, and judging from the snores coming from the back, both Graham and Grandpap were taking their early evening pre-nap nap. What would he do if she settled her hand over his? She bit her lip and looked back out her window into the falling darkness. Pretty soon, and she wouldn't be able to tell how deep the ravines were. She pulled her hand out from under her purse and set it on her leg eyeing his hand again on the shifter. He'd basically told her he'd had a crush on her for a long time. No, he'd told her he wanted to kiss her for a long time, which wasn't really the same thing. Was it? She didn't know. Even though her divorce had been final for two years, it had been so long since she'd felt free to look or even think about someone other than Ken. She'd been busy with her children. She was still busy with her children, 
but Zayden had been helping her. Had he wanted to kiss her this past 4th of July? She had been glad for the darkness that covered any trace of expression on her face as he fed her the s'mores. She definitely spent more than a few minutes thinking of kissing him. There were not many cars left on the road. Most sensible people didn't try to cross mountains in snowstorms. If only the presents for her children weren't in the trunk of her car, she would tell him to turn around. Something told her, though, that he would make sure the presents got to her children on Christmas. Her heart warmed at the thought. And she lifted her hand, setting it down over his, feeling the warmth and roughness. His head jerked, his gaze first looking at their touching hands, then shifting up to her eyes. His own were wide, surprised, unsure. His brows lifted. Despite the trembling in her stomach, she smiled, a little question keeping her lips from turning up too much. He grinned, full on, back at her. His hand flipped under hers, and he threaded his fingers with hers. She looked at their hands, woven together. That looks right to me, she heard herself say. It feels right to me, his deeper voice echoed. I, I wanted to kiss you before too, she whispered. But you thought I was gay, he said with a slight edge to his voice. She looked down at her hands. I was too afraid to ask. I scare you? No, not that kind of fear. The kind where... She took a deep breath. It wasn't comfortable to open oneself and show the parts, as Zayden had put it. Where your husband left you for another woman, and it makes you wonder what's wrong with you and what you did that caused him to leave, and whether anyone could ever see anything good in you again. His fingers tightened around hers. Makes me want to punch my brother. Although, I have to admit his leaving you gave me the first hope I've had in years. She grunted, not quite a laugh. I wouldn't want you to go through that pain just for me, though. It was necessary, I think. He never really wanted me to begin with. Zayden's lips tightened, but he didn't argue. Blythe had been Ken's rebound relationship after his college sweetheart broke up with him. I was kind of enamored with the whole doctor thing, and just kind of in awe of him. I noticed, Zayden said with a little irony. I can't believe you thought about me. You were nice to our mom, who wasn't, and still isn't, easy to get along with. And I admired the way you took care of your gram. Still do. In fact, I think you showed up at our house for your first meal with our family with your gram in tow. That really impressed me. She looked over at him, shocked. Ken was mad at me for a week over that. Zayden shrugged. I guess we've always valued different things. You're actually a lot different than the rest of your family. He chuckled. I guess what they say about the second child wanting to be different than the first was applicable in our case. But your mom is so... Blythe waved her other hand, looking for a word. A nice word. Highbrowed, Zayden suggested. I suppose. I kind of felt she was relieved when Ken divorced me. Flashing lights shone through the darkness up ahead. Zayden took his foot off the gas and the car slowed naturally. He looked over at Blythe. I hope this, he held up their linked hands, is something I get to talk to my mother about. Blythe studied the lights as they drew closer. It looked like the road ahead was closed at the exit. I hate to admit it, but that was the main source of my hesitation. I shouldn't care what other people will think but I did worry some about your mother. His father was happily married to his fourth wife and living in California. In all the years she'd been with Ken, she'd only met him once. 
At least she didn't have to worry about him. Zayden studied the traffic ahead, pulling off the exit and motoring slowly down it. So does this, he held up their hands again, mean that you decided it was worth it? Yes, she said softly. So you're with me. Is that what you want? Yeah, more than anything. What a time for him to finally declare his feelings. Well, he hadn't exactly declared all his feelings. It was probably too soon to tell her he loved her and had loved her for a very long time. But he wasn't sure where they were or where they were going now that they'd been directed to get off the interstate. Would you mind trying to figure out how to get around? I assumed it's an accident and the whole road isn't shut down. It's not that bad out. Blythe looked at the road like she might argue, but she didn't. Instead, she grabbed her phone from her purse and began scrolling through. The car a hundred yards ahead of them turned right, so he turned right too, since there was a big truck coming down the ramp behind them, and he didn't want to sit at the stop sign hoping it didn't jackknife into them. At least the snores coming from the back indicated that Graham and Grandpap were still asleep. He wouldn't mind just stopping and holding Blythe for a while, finding out where the newness of their relationship would take them. Maybe find some mistletoe. I'm getting the map app up, but I only have one bar of service, so it's slow. That's fine, he said. The road they were on hadn't been plowed in a while, and the lines were covered under an inch of snow. Just another 15 miles and we'd have been out of the mountains, he commented. There probably weren't a ton of roads that would take them north through the mountains. Anywhere else, and there'd be roads crisscrossing everywhere. He'd be pretty confident about finding one that would work. But here? We lost? Grandpap's voice came from the back seat. I've managed to lose two cars already today. I suppose it's not out of the realm of possibility. Zayden slowed as the road took a hairpin left turn. I'm glad it's dark, Graham said. Her voice sounded a little shaky. But Blythe laughed. <laughs> Me too. I'm afraid of heights. Are you really? He asked, surprised. He hadn't known that about her. Yep. But you rode the roller coaster at the amusement park this summer. I shut my eyes as soon as it started up the hill and didn't open them until it pulled back into the station. He laughed. You must have had your eyes closed earlier, too. Those are some sharp drop-offs back there. Here, too, Grandpap said ominously from the back. For some reason, it sent a shiver through Zayden but he shrugged like he hadn't felt a thing. That's okay. This car must have been built by an Eskimo, because it drives like a dream in the snow. This is definitely a good car for the snow, Blythe murmured, distracted because of looking at her phone. I'm sorry, there just isn't any service. Well, then we'll drive until we get service or until we find a place to stop and ask for directions. You'll stop and ask for directions? Blythe asked, shocked. Sure, <laughs> why not? It'd be kind of dumb not to do it in weather like this with no cell service. How much gas do we have? Graham asked from the back. Grandpap shushed her. There was just enough light from the dash for Zayden to see Grandpap take her hand. He tried to get Blythe's attention by looking over at her. When she looked up at him, he jerked his head back and put a finger to his lips. She twisted inconspicuously, and her face split into a smile when she saw their hands. She gave him the thumbs up. He nodded and looked back at the road. They had almost three quarters of a tank, so they should be good. But he'd feel a lot better once they were out of the mountains. Chapter 5 It was an hour before Blythe had enough signal on her phone for a long enough time to get the map app to work. 
I think we're actually headed in the right direction. It says an hour until we get to our destination. One side of Zayden's mouth curved up into a lopsided smile. The one she loved. That's just peachy. How soon until we get to a gas station? I need to stop, Graham said from the back seat. Blythe studied the map. Can you wait maybe 30 minutes? If I have to, Graham said a little belligerently. She always got testy when she was out past her bedtime. Even though it wasn't late, only seven, it was still past time for Graham to be winding down for the night. They were in and out of service, but Blythe could follow the directions without any trouble, and it didn't feel like too long until they came to a small mom-and-pop gas station. Zayden pulled up to the front door. I'll just stay here in the car until someone else comes out. Blythe laughed. <laughs> Learned your lesson, did you? She helped Graham in, then he helped Grandpap out. Blythe wasn't sure exactly what she was kind of hoping for. A little private exchange, a stolen kiss, a touch of his hand. Not sure, but she hung around while Zayden walked in, then walked back out with him. He gave her a smile, but she had kind of wanted more. What were they to each other? It wasn't a question she could talk to him about with Graham and Grandpap in the back. Still, she wasn't going to let her thoughts bother her. She wasn't going to second guess all the things he'd said. Ken hadn't been satisfied with her, but Zayden was a completely different story. Zayden was buckling his seatbelt when his phone rang. He looked at the number, then glanced at her. Was that guilt pinching his face? A sliver of unease rippled through her. But there was no denying he answered his phone and turned toward the window. Hello? he said softly. She shouldn't listen, she really shouldn't, but she couldn't help it. No, not tonight. Yeah, tomorrow. We'll see. He glanced over at her. She jerked her head down like she was looking at her phone, only it was blank because she didn't have it on at all. I'll call you tomorrow sometime. Yes, we'll get it. Okay, have a good evening. Bye. He pressed the red button on his phone, clicked and swiped a couple more times. She couldn't be sure, but she thought he was erasing the record of the call, then threw his phone in the cup holder. Everyone ready to head out of here? He asked, looking over at her, then into the rearview mirror. That sounded mysterious. Blythe tried to sound unconcerned, but she was nosy, and yes, after Ken, she was insecure. Zayden wasn't anything like his brother, but for some reason, maybe because having a relationship with him was a huge step for her, she needed that little reassurance. That was probably his lady friend, admirer, whatever you want to call her, Grandpap said from the back seat. Huh? Zayden said. Blythe couldn't decide if he was truly confused or just trying to hide something. He shifted in to reverse. You know, that girl that's always calling you. Grandpap's voice got low and conspiratorial. You better snatch him up, Blythe girl. That other woman has been trying to sink her claws into him for almost a year now. That's enough, Grandpap, Zayden said curtly. <laughs> Testy, Grandpap said gruffly from the back seat, but he didn't say anything more. By eight o'clock, they pulled into a nice house in an upscale subdivision where Blythe's car sat, pulled off to the side of the driveway. An older lady came out to meet them, but they didn't chat long. Zayden apologized and told her there was no bill for the work he'd done. They moved their few things. Blythe helped Graham in and Zayden opened the door for Grandpap. The snow had thinned out some, but it was still coming down. Do you want me to drive? Zayden asked. Do you mind? I like driving. Even in snow? Especially in snow. He grinned. Let's pop the trunk and just make sure that everything is in there. Relief flooded through her chest. 
You read my mind. I thought I was being paranoid. He started the car and flicked the latch for the trunk. They met at the back of the car. All the gifts she'd gotten were in the back, just like she'd left them. This just made my day. Zayden turned to face her. That kiss from earlier made mine. He moved a little closer, and she breathed in his spicy, working man scent. I've been having an argument with myself most of the way here about whether it was actually as good as I thought it was. Part of me says no kiss could have been that good. Really? Through the snow and the dark and the roads and being lost, you weren't actually thinking about all of that, but rather trying to figure out my kiss. Yep. He shoved one hand in his pocket and leaned a hip against the edge of her trunk. The only thing that's going to give me any peace at all on the way home is if you kiss me again, so I can know for sure how good it was. Oh, now I have to kiss you for your peace of mind. That's right. She stepped closer, a little smile tugging the corners of her mouth up. She liked this more playful, flirting side of Zayden. He was always smiling, but didn't usually tease her. He typically treated her with kid gloves. It was nice the gloves had finally come off. I wouldn't want you to be upset if it's in my power to fix it. She leaned closer, her lips almost brushing him as she spoke. She'd meant to tease him some, but the lightning bolts that shot down her back and through her stomach were wreaking havoc with her good plans. Kind of you. His lips did brush hers. A little moan slipped out of her mouth. It drove him into action. His lips caught hers. His hands pulled her closer. His body curled around her. Heat exploded in waves of color behind her closed eyes. She pressed closer, her hands touching his curled hair, before thrusting into it, cradling his neck, tugging him closer still. This time, he was the one who pulled back, his breath coming in short gasps, his eyes still half-closed. She hadn't wanted to release him, but she still had enough of her brain functioning that she knew they couldn't stand behind her car and make out all night. Her hands slipped out of his hair, wandering down across his broad shoulders, feeling the ridges of his muscles under his tee catching the ripple as her hands moved lower, down the hard ribs of his back and following the line of his narrowing waist. He captured both of her hands in his, threading their fingers together, dropping another couple of kisses on her forehead and cheeks. Which side have you won? She whispered. <laughs> Neither. He laughed. <laughs> Neither of them were even close to being right about how good kissing you is. He laughed again. <laughs> I'm going to stand up here in a minute and shut your trunk. Just as soon as my knees stop feeling like they're filled with used motor oil instead of bones. She laughed, still a little shaky herself. Maybe when we get home we can practice some more. He looked down into her laughing face his own expression completely serious. I don't think I can take too much more practicing. He ran a hand through his longish hair and sighed a wobbly sigh. But I could definitely help you wrap these gifts so they're still ready like you planned. I'll just have to drop Graham and Grandpap off first. She waved a hand. You don't have to do that. I want to. I'm not going to turn down help. She took a breath, feeling almost ready to try standing on her own again. Zayden's kissing was powerful. His ringtone rang out. If she hadn't been leaning against him, she might have missed the look that passed over his face. Almost like panic. He quickly covered it, pulling his phone out and giving her a superficial smile. A thread of suspicion snaked around her backbone, joining with the uneasy feeling left from the last phone call he had. I need to get this. He waved his phone. Then I'll be ready to go. 
he didn't quite meet her eye. Just like Ken before he left her. She narrowed her eyes, but Zayden had already turned and walked away from the car. Chapter 6 Zayden took another sip of his coffee as he pulled away from his house after walking Grandpap up the stairs. The bitter taste nipped at his tongue, but he needed it to make the drive home. He glanced over at Blythe. She sat with her head back, eyes closed, although he was pretty sure she wasn't asleep. Just quiet. Had been the whole way home, and he wasn't sure why. But he was hoping she was just tired. She'd clammed up after their kiss, though, and he was a little worried about that. Thanks for walking Graham in when you dropped her off. Blythe's voice startled him. He pulled into her driveway. No problem. She's just as sharp as ever. I think our matchmaking really worked today. I think you're right. She lifted her head and unbuckled her seatbelt. You don't have to come in. It won't take long at all to wrap these. Her tone was cool and aloof. She really sounded like she didn't want him in. Hopefully it was just from the long day. After all, it was nearly 3 a.m. Unless you kick me out, I'm coming in and helping. It's my fault this isn't done already. We already had that argument. And I won, he said with one lip lifted. They got out of the car, Blythe going to unlock the door, Zayden heading to the trunk to carry some gifts in. The snow had stopped after they crossed south of I-80, like it often did, and although the pavement was damp from a light drizzle, it wasn't frozen. He still walked in carefully, balancing several larger packages in his arms, along with carrying several bags in both hands. Blythe had plugged her tree in and several strings of lights. She stood at the piano lighting a candle, slim and beautiful, her hair falling down her back, her green sweater falling casually over her worn jeans. Zayden admired the sight until she turned. Oh, she said. Here, you can set those things down in front of the couch. She helped relieve him of his burden, setting the gifts down. If you don't mind, I thought we'd wrap them in here beside the tree. Normally, I drag a table in when Graham helps, but I sit on the floor. Sounds good to me. Great. I'll grab my box of paper and accessories and be back in a sec. He watched her walk out of the room, the glow from the Christmas tree lights reflecting in her hair. She was being nice, but standoffish. Well, he'd waited a long time to kiss her. He wasn't going to waste any more time wondering what the issue was. He'd just ask. But she came back and immediately started giving directions. He wasn't the best rapper in the world, and he had to listen carefully since she wrapped Rand's gifts in three colors and Lottie's gifts in another, so they didn't know whose were whose until Christmas morning. It's awful when you get them confused, she said with a self-effacing grin. I did it one year and Lottie opened one of Rand's gifts. It was all he talked about all day to anyone who would listen, how Lottie had opened one of his presents. You'd have thought it was the only one he got. Actually, I think I remember that year. My parents were home and you and Ken brought the kids over for an evening dinner. He laughed. <laughs> I remember Rand talking about it, and you didn't look very happy. She snorted as she used the scissors to cut the paper. It was Ken who screwed up. I'm sure I wasn't very happy with him. She shook her head and ripped off a piece of tape. Looking back, it was such a little thing, so dumb to get upset about it. She had turned the Christmas music on low, and it filled the silence. Unspoken was the idea that there were bigger things to get upset about, like a little boy and girl who wouldn't have their daddy with them on Christmas this year. My parents texted me yesterday. Their plane arrived safely in Acapulco. Her lip pulled back. Ken called to talk to the kids. 
I didn't really talk to him, but he'll probably call the kids on Christmas. At some point. Zayden swallowed. He focused on creasing the paper so it folded over perfectly. He pressed a piece of tape down. I'm not very good with bows and ribbons. You want to do that? You go ahead. The kids aren't going to notice anyway. I just like to see the pretty presents under the tree. I'll probably sit for a while after the kids go to bed tonight and admire it. You should come down to the live nativity at the Methodist church down by the river. I'll be Joseph. <laughs> Sounds cold. He laughed as he cut a length of green ribbon. The sweet scent of the spicy candle she'd lit drifted over and mixed with her cinnamon and vanilla smell. He had to remind himself he was wrapping presents because he wanted to be distracted. Yeah, it'll be cold. Lots of long underwear under the robe. I don't think Joseph wore long underwear. He is tomorrow night. They laughed together. <laughs> I'll bring the kids by. Probably my mom and Graham, too. What is Pap doing? I could get him. Somehow, he finagled his way into being in charge of handing out the hot chocolate inside the nice warm church basement. If you ask nicely, he'll probably sneak you coffee if you want it. Hot chocolate is perfect. He held his gift up. The bow was lopsided, but his wrap job was pretty neat. Nice, she said, glancing up. He set the wrapped present under the tree, then slowly leaned back. It had been bothering him for a while, and he figured the best thing to do was just flat out ask. You seemed a little upset at me earlier. Was I imagining it? Blythe kept her hands busy and didn't look up. Should I have been upset? He noticed she didn't exactly answer the question, which, in his experience, probably meant she actually was upset. No. He gave his honest answer. Then, because it was late and he didn't want to keep her up because she had to be tired, he grabbed another gift and started rapping. She allowed the silence to lengthen. Finally, he prompted her. I think the problem must have had to do with me kissing you. Were you regretting it? Her face shot up. No, she said, almost breathlessly. Good. His mouth twisted up and the ache in his chest eased. That had been his biggest fear. I'm kind of hoping I'll get to do it a lot more. Her head was down as she tied a neat gold bow on her gift but he could see her lips lift. Another good sign. Help me out, please. If I did something to offend you, tell me. I promise I won't get upset. I'd like to fix it. She didn't answer right away, and he grabbed the last present and began wrapping it. The music purred softly in the background, and he tried to stop thinking about what the issue might have been and just focus on enjoying a peaceful and romantic evening with the woman he'd admired for a long time. By the time she was done rapping, she still hadn't said anything. She set it neatly under the tree and admired the picture the gifts made for a moment before standing. Zayden put the lid on her box of Christmas paper and ribbon and followed her up. So you're not telling me. He stepped closer. She bit her lip and looked at the tree. You got two phone calls and you just looked guilty when you answered them. Her head tilted up and her eyes drilled into his. How many women do you have strung out on your line? I'm only angling for one, he murmured, surprised. She had to be talking about the two phone calls he'd gotten from Rand. And she was right. He couldn't tell her about them. I haven't had a woman outside of the family call me on my cell phone for so long, I bet I couldn't even dig up a number on it. She crossed her arms over her chest. The defensive posturing reminded him that Ken had given her good reason to be suspicious of men. He shoved a hand through his hair and blew out a breath. But you're right. I really don't want to tell you who called me. I don't care, she said. 
I want you to care, he responded. She shrugged. You can have a hundred women calling you every day. Fine with me. I just have issues with kissing a man who doesn't limit his girls to one at a time. It's not one at a time. It's just one. She had to believe him, but her lips pressed together and her arms stayed crossed. It's fine, Zayden. It's not like you owe me fidelity after we exchanged a kiss or two. She dropped her hands and turned away. I just don't want to make a habit of it. I can't tell you who called. He touched her arm and she stopped, her back toward him. But I promise you it wasn't a woman. She looked over her shoulder with a raised brow. No. He rolled his eyes and pulled. She turned to face him. No, it wasn't a boyfriend either. Ken is such a liar. I believed you. He ran his hands up and down her arms. Believe me about this too, please. Her head tilted and he noticed the dark circles under her eyes. I need to leave so you can get a little rest. He pulled her gently toward him. Are we good? She nodded. He had to accept that. Tomorrow he could tell her who called and what they wanted. But if he told her tonight, it could spoil everything they'd worked so hard for. I'll let myself out. You lock up behind me and get to bed. He'd hoped for another sweet kiss, but he didn't want an unwilling one, and he didn't want to kiss a woman who didn't trust him. So he turned to go. Zayden? Yeah? He looked over his shoulder. She walked slowly to him, coming around and standing in front of him. His heart just about catapulted out of his chest when she slid her arms up his chest and around his neck. Her hands threaded through his hair and her body flattened against his. He groaned. Can I kiss you goodnight? She whispered. He bent his head down, a little smile on his face, despite the heat flashing through his body. I'll just let you know now, for any time in the future, if you want to kiss me, just grab me and do it. There will never be a time when the answer to that question is no. His hands glided around her waist, and he pulled her flush against him. I didn't want you to think that I go around kissing men all the time. Her hand stilled in his hair. Actually, I haven't kissed a man since my divorce. I know. Really? Blythe, I can't believe that you haven't known that I've been crazy about you. Of course I know these things. He dropped his head and his lips touched hers, gently, sweetly. Little touches. She sighed. I'm not going to be able to resist you. I don't want you to. Where is this going? Her eyes popped open. Don't you think people are going to think that it's weird that I'm with my ex-husband's brother? People have been talking about how madly in love I am with you for a long time and they're going to say it's about time you put that poor man out of his misery. She froze. Her entire body stiffened. Her hands landed on his shoulders and pushed. No, that's not true. You don't love me. You can't. It's too fast. I... She backed up. He let her go. She was right. He'd gone too fast and shocked her. Maybe she didn't feel the same. But he wasn't walking back anything that was the truth. I'm sorry. You weren't ready, and I let my big mouth get ahead of me. He shoved his hands in his pockets. I've been waiting on you for a long time. I'm not going anywhere. But I'm not pushing you either. I don't want you with me out of pity, or because you don't know how to tell me no. I'm here. I'm ready, as far and as fast as you want to go. 
but I'm not taking anything you're not ready and willing to give. He turned and walked to the door. As he stepped through, he paused. I do love you. Have for a long time. Whatever you feel, nothing's changed on my end. I won't make it awkward. Stepping out, he closed the door softly behind him. Hunching his shoulders against the cold, he walked to the car, wondering what it meant that she'd not stopped him and hadn't said anything. What's a live nativity? Lottie asked as they pulled into the Methodist church parking lot a little after seven on Christmas Eve. Blythe had been distracted all day and now wasn't any different. Her mom answered. It's where they have real animals and people pretending to be Mary and Joseph and the shepherds. She pointed. Look, I see sheep. A whole herd of sheep milled about in a makeshift pen that was set up beside a small hut. Come on, kiddos, let's walk over. Blythe looked around. Don't touch anything until I ask, but I think you'll be allowed to pet the animals. Yay! Lottie shouted. Where's Uncle Zayden? Rand asked. He should be in front of this building here. Blythe pulled her gloves up and hunched a little deeper in her jacket. The temperature was well below freezing, and although there was no expected accumulation, random snowflakes fell softly among the milling people. Her children danced around them as they walked over. Her mother leaned over. Did Ken call them? Not today. He probably will tomorrow. Two years ago, you didn't hear from them the entire Christmas season. I know, but that was right after he left. It was almost a year after he left. They were still in their honeymoon phase. It'll wear off. Blythe appreciated her mother's support, even if it wasn't exactly what she wanted to think about on Christmas Eve. Ken's girlfriend, Sherry, was probably very nice although Blythe had never heard anyone say so. The words gold digger, fake, and homebreaker had all come up in various conversations. But that was with her friends, and they were probably being nice. Sherry had something that Blythe didn't, apparently. Although Zayden had made her feel cherished and valuable last night, and she admired him, definitely liked him, but love? Was she ready to do love again? Her heart pounded and her palms sweated inside her gloves. Her brain wanted her to stay far away from anything having to do with love, but she was afraid her heart had already made up its mind. There's the brother you should have married. They had come around the corner of the shed beside the sheep. She spun her head and stared at her mother. What? Zayden, he's the brother you should have married. Zayden had said last night that everyone knew he was in love with her. She dismissed it as just talking. But what was her mother saying? What makes you say that? Ken's all studious. He's a doctor and everything. But Zayden is the steady one. He plants his feet and they stay planted. Ken, he studies hard but he parties hard too. That was true. Blythe wasn't much of a partier, but Ken had always wanted to kick it up on his days off. Stress relief, he said. Zayden was so laid back and easygoing, he probably didn't need stress relief. She couldn't really picture him partying anyway. Sure, he was funny and enjoyed laughing, but he looked right at home last night wrapping gifts with her. Maybe it was presumptuous, but as they wrapped, she could picture them together under the tree every year. She wouldn't mind. Her mother waved and Blythe looked up. Zayden stood behind the cradle, wrapped in a brown robe. He jerked his head at them and smiled at Rand and Lottie. Where's Mary? Lottie asked. Blythe had been wondering the same thing. It was odd to see just Joseph by the manger. 
She got cold, one of the shepherds said. We tried to get Joseph to warm her up, but he wasn't having any of it, another one said. A horse neighed on the side opposite the sheep. Hey, look, there's a baby calf. Lottie pointed between the horse pen and the stable, where two little brown calves snuggled in a bed of golden straw. A couple of chickens perched on the rail fence behind them, and a big mama cow looked on with soft brown eyes, quietly chewing her cud. The kids walked over, joining a group of ten or so other children. Are they allowed to pet them? Yeah, they only brought animals that are calm. Zayden adjusted his headpiece. Larry is there, too. He owns the horse, and he's making sure no one gets stepped on. <laughs> okay, that's good. Zayden, think your sister-in-law would be interested in filling in as Mary? The first shepherd said with a wink. Zayden lifted his brows at Blythe. Don't think you'd have a problem keeping her warm. If her cheeks weren't already rosy from the cold, that comment would have made her face flame like a fire engine. Suspect you're right, Zayden said with a grin, and Blythe actually put her hands on her cheeks. They've got a robe in the church, and they'd love it if you'd stick it on and come out here and kneel for an hour. His eyes darkened. I'll make sure you stay warm. The shepherds howled beside him. They stopped abruptly as another group of people walked around the side of the shed. Where's Mary? A little boy asked. You go ahead, honey. I'll take the kids to my house and you can have Zayden pick them up there. Her mom whispered in her ear, then patted her arm. I'll be back. Blythe walked to the church, glad she'd chosen her warm boots over her more stylish brown leather ones. Zayden could keep everything else warm, but he'd look pretty funny holding her toes in his hands trying to thaw them. The basement smelled like hot chocolate with a hint of coffee hiding in the shadows. Everyone was thrilled she'd agreed to be Mary and she was back out kneeling beside baby Jesus, the only part of the nativity that wasn't real. If it were summer, we could probably get a baby, but it would be child abuse to have a little one sitting out in this cold. She wondered, as she often had after she'd had children of her own, how Mary had managed. Did it get cold in that part of the world? What season was it anyway? She supposed it didn't matter, but they were questions she'd never even considered until her own children had come along. One mother relating to another, she supposed. Only Mary's husband had stood with her. Ken never would have. But Satan would. The little voice in her head whispered softly, even as Zayden's hand settled on her shoulder. The warmth of his legs soaked through her back. She tried to look serene as she stared at the baby doll in the manger, but her emotions roiled around in her head, poking and prickling and keeping her on edge. She didn't want to be with a man just because he'd never leave, but that was definitely a requirement for the next husband. He needed to stick through everything. Still, what she felt for Zayden wasn't exactly what she'd felt for Ken all those years ago. She was older, for one. Those emotions seemed so silly and schoolgirlish. Her feelings for Zayden came from her woman's heart. She admired his strength of character, his work ethic, his gentleness with her children, his willingness to make a wrong right no matter the inconvenience to himself. Like her car. He'd driven the whole way to New York in a snowstorm to get it back for her. She blinked. How could she not love a man who would do that? She loved Satan? Her heart bloomed in her chest, and the feelings that felt so scattered just a few moments ago settled down into a calmness that eased her soul. Yes, she loved Satan, and she couldn't wait to tell him about it. Tonight. What better night to tell him than Christmas Eve?
at least she hadn't acted weird around him. Zayden had been afraid after his early morning declaration that Blythe might be uncomfortable with him, but Blythe had been fine. He even seemed happy to see him. They waved a last goodbye to the church folk. I'll bring the car around, Grandpap, Zayden said. I'll come with you. Blythe tucked her coat tighter around her waist. She didn't take his hand, which didn't exactly surprise him, with all the people who were watching them. She probably wasn't ready to take anything public. The door closed behind them. A few people still milled in the parking lot, and Zayden kept his hands at his sides, rather than putting an arm around Blythe like he really wanted to. I'm going to assume that you want to have a little time to get used to the idea of you and me before you tell your children. She shoved her hands in her coat pockets and walked with her head lowered before she blinked up at him. I'm not ashamed of you. It's just... He shrugged, shoving off the disappointment. He understood that with children, things could get a little sticky, especially since their father was his brother. I get it. The words came out a little more curt than he intended, but Blythe didn't comment, and soon they had Grandpap in the car and dropped him off at Zayden's. I can walk home from here. Blythe got out of his pickup while he helped Grandpap up the walk. Hang on, I'll walk with you. You don't have to. His gaze drilled hers. He understood why she didn't want to tell anyone about their relationship, whatever it was. He also understood why she'd be hesitant about even having a relationship after being burned so badly by his brother. But surely she knew and understood that he wanted to spend as much time as possible with her, that he liked spending time with her. I want to, he said low and soft. Grandpap opened the front door and shuffled through. You kids go along. I'm going to heat up some soup. He wagged his finger at Zayden. Treat her good, son. Zayden stared at Blythe. She didn't look away. I intend to. A shadow passed over her eyes, like she could hardly believe that someone would respect her enough to treat her well. Or maybe she didn't believe him. But what more could he do to prove to her that he'd be here? She either had to believe or not. The front door clicked closed. Blythe dropped her gaze. Satan's heart drooped. After a pause, what more could he do? He went down the front porch steps and stopped in front of Blythe. It's dark, and I don't think anyone will notice if I walk you home and hold your hand. Is that okay? Please don't be angry. I'm not. I get it. You have to keep your kids in mind first. I respect that, and I've worked hard to be there for them. Not only because I love you, but because I love them as well. But you know them best. I know what I want. I've wanted it for years. I can wait. The tight lines on her face relaxed. Thanks. Her hand slipped into his and a thrill shot through his soul. They started down the block, their linked hands swinging between them. Just inside her mother's gate, she stopped and pulled him off the path. He allowed her to lead him to the old maple tree, a small grin hovering over his lips. When she turned him around and pushed his back against the rough bark, he couldn't stop himself from pulling her into him, lifting her feet from the ground. She laughed, pulling his head down to hers her lips reaching and searching. They came together in a passionate embrace, her hot body against his, all rational thoughts fleeing. Headlights flashed and Blythe jerked back. Zayden set her down and she stumbled back, turning as the car pulled to the curb and the motor shut off. Zayden's chest heaved as his brother stepped out of the car. Blythe gasped. Zayden put his hand out and she turned. Leave, she hissed. Now? Zayden opened his mouth, 
he wasn't going to just leave her here to explain everything by herself. Please, she begged. Let me handle this. Just leave. Zayden? Ken squinted. Blythe? Are you sure? He said, his voice barely audible. Go, she insisted once more. Against everything he'd ever wanted, and against all that he thought he should do, he turned and walked to the back of the house, hopping over the fence and taking the back alley to the next street, striding up the sidewalk away from the woman he loved to his home. Blythe looked out over the street. Snow had started to fall sometime after midnight, and now at just past 2 a.m., the street and yard outside her window were all white. Snow clung to the big old maple. Her heart pounded. Just a few hours ago, Satan had kissed her more thoroughly than she'd ever been kissed before, right there under that maple tree that had watched her walk up the walk as a new bride on Ken's arm. It had been there the day he'd walked out on her, too. And now, it had listened tonight as Ken had the audacity to inform her that he was stopping in to see his children and didn't expect to see their mother draping herself over some random hookup in the front yard. Interestingly, Sherry had not been with him. She'd allowed Ken to come in and see the children, who had been full of questions. Ken hadn't come right out and declared it, but it had sounded like he and Sherry had a fight, and he'd left her in Cancun. Blythe bit her lip and soothed herself by watching the snow falling against the light of the streetlight. Her children had begged for Ken to come to dinner tomorrow. He'd even offered to pick Graham up and bring her. How could she refuse? And what was she going to do? Zayden would be there. Talk about awkward. Especially since Ken had caught her as he walked out, asking for another chance before kissing her. A shadow drifted through the branches of the tree coming down the sidewalk. She'd recognize that long-legged, unhurried stride anywhere. Why would Zayden be walking down the street at 2 a.m. on Christmas morning? Was he coming to see her? He was headed toward his house, though. Her heart sped up as he passed by her gate. She gasped and took a step back as he looked up, seeming to see right into her window. It was dark. He couldn't see. Surely he couldn't. His stride never slowed, and he turned his head walking out of sight. What about that phone call that he swore wasn't a woman? She should have asked to see his phone. Was that why he was walking around town in the middle of the night? She couldn't think of another reason that someone would be out and about. Part of her said she was being ridiculous. Part of her said she'd been there before. She, if anyone, ought to know that men cheated. She allowed the curtain to fall back as she turned and slipped in to bed. Ten years ago, she never dreamed that she'd be spending Christmas Eve night cold and alone in bed by herself. Tomorrow, there would be two men at the table who had each let her know that they wanted to be with her. One had already had a chance. The other had only declared his position because of a mix-up with her car. If that hadn't happened, she still wouldn't know how Zayden claimed he felt. Ken was offering her a chance to put her family back together. Ken's mistake had given her a chance to patch together a new family. She rolled over. Or she could continue the way she'd been for the last two years and keep going, by herself. Chapter 7 Zayden helped Grandpap up the walk. Blythe had responded to his Merry Christmas text this morning with a Merry Christmas of her own, but nothing more. And he hadn't been able to bring himself to say any more. Not after Ken's visit last night. 
The unmistakable scent of vanilla and cinnamon had clung to his coat like blue on a bruise, giving truth to his declaration that he and Blythe were getting back together. Zayden didn't want to get between them, if that was really what Blythe wanted. He'd stepped back before, and he'd do it again, for Blythe. They'd barely gotten inside before Graham made her way over and almost threw herself into Grandpap's arms. Did you tell him? She asked. Thought we'd do it together, Grandpap said with one hand on his walker and one arm around Graham. Curious as to what they were talking about, Zayden didn't move from the door. But he'd seen Ken's car outside, parked along the street, with snow on the windshield indicating that it had been sitting there since early this morning, or late last night, and his heart desperately wanted to know where Blythe was. Or, more specifically, if she had allowed her ex-husband back into her life and heart. What did you want to tell us, Graham? Blythe asked, carrying a big platter of turkey into the room and setting it down on the table before turning to face the door and wiping her hands on her white, frilly apron. Ken came in right behind her, carrying a bowl of mashed potatoes. Her mother followed with stuffing. Rand and Lottie followed with rolls and cranberries. They formed a semicircle in front of Graham and Grandpap. Zayden felt slightly out of place as he stood off to the side, just in front of the door. Blythe hadn't looked at him. Her hair was down in soft waves around her face, and the red sweater she wore emphasized her light brown eyes. He couldn't pull his eyes away, although he should. Ken put a possessive hand on her shoulder. She didn't shrug it off. We're getting, Graham started, married. married. Grandpap joined her for the last word. They laced their fingers together and threw their clasped hands into the air. Rand and Lottie screamed, excited just because their Graham was excited. Blythe's mother put her hand to her mouth as her eyes filled. She pushed forward and hugged her mother. Blythe's face glowed. Finally, her eyes found his. Their matchmaking had worked. Ken's arm snaked around her shoulder. She moved, gliding toward Zayden. His chest filled. His feet begged to move, but he kept himself still. She might be coming over to say something benign, or worse. Desperate to hold her, he kept his face impassive. If she wanted him, she knew she could have him. He'd told her so yesterday. He wasn't going to guilt her into any decision she didn't want. I saw you last night. I saw you. At 2 a.m.? He'd meant earlier and shook his head. The house was dark. She'd seen him. He searched out Rand, but he was busy talking to his grandparents. Rand gave me the picture frame you helped him make. She tilted her head. That was a beautiful picture of the kids and me. I hadn't even realized you took it. I didn't think you knew. He shrugged pressing down on his heart, which wanted to move closer. The light was perfect, and you looked beautiful as you knelt with your arms around them. After I snapped the shot, I thought you'd like to see it. But Rand approached me about helping him with a Christmas gift, and I thought of that right away. His voice trailed off as she moved closer. It was beautiful. Thank you. She fingered the pearl necklace around her neck. Zayden didn't recognize it and wondered if it was a gift from Ken. He'd almost always gotten Blythe jewelry for all occasions. Zayden, I... Blythe started. Come on, everyone. Let's eat while the food is hot. Blythe's mother herded Graham and Grandpap to the table. Uncle Zayden! Rand called. He ran over and threw his arms around Zayden's waist. Zayden knelt catching Lottie as she tumbled into his arms behind her brother. Her serious face and dark eyes looked so much like Blythe that his heart twisted as he hugged them both close. He'd almost allowed himself to believe that they could have been his. 
Merry Christmas, you two. They babbled about their gifts and their mourning and how surprised Blythe was with her gift, as they each grabbed one of his hands and skipped beside him to the table. Ken already sat at the head. Zayden hung back, helping Grandpap scoot his chair in, waiting until everyone else had gotten a seat before he took the only one left, between Graham and Rand. After they prayed and passed the food, Blythe's mother asked Graham and Grandpap about their engagement. Grandpap started telling the story of the car confusion of the day before and how it had thrown him together with Graham, and how they had realized that they each felt the same about the other. Life is short. Can't waste a minute, Grandpap said, holding Graham's hand on the table. We're getting married on New Year's Eve, and I'll be moving her in with us. He looked over at Zayden. I couldn't be happier about that, Grandpap, Zayden said, and meant it. If he were being honest, he'd have to admit to being a little jealous. But he truly was thrilled for Graham and Grandpap. Feeling her gaze like a physical touch, he turned his head to see Blythe staring at him. He forced his mouth to curve into a smile. Their matchmaking efforts had worked better than either one of them had thought they would. Well, that's romantic, Ken said. I'm happy for you too, Grandpap. Ken seemed sincere, and Zayden pushed down his annoyance. Blythe wasn't the only one Ken had ignored over the years. Grandpap had pretty much been Zayden's responsibility for a long time. Not that he cared but Ken had a habit of leaving the people who loved him when something more interesting caught his eye. But I have news of my own. Ken stood. He lifted a brow, looking at Blythe. Blythe and I have spoken at length, and we have decided to try again. The back of Zayden's throat closed, and his stomach clenched. Grateful he'd not eaten much, he reached for his water and took a big swallow. Blythe stood. That's what you decided, Ken. She reached up and unhooked the pearl necklace from around her neck. I hadn't had a chance to say anything when we were interrupted. She held the necklace up. Thank you for the thought behind this beautiful gift, but I can't accept it. Zayden's eyes flew to hers. Hope swelled in his chest. Two years ago, even last year, I would have been all about trying to make things work between us. She set the necklace on the table. That's not really a discussion for here, though. Her brow crinkled and she looked at her children. Ran chewed with both cheeks bulging out. Lottie's hands were in her lap and she watched with serious, unblinking eyes. Blythe bit her lip as she studied her daughter and Zayden's chest deflated. Her children would hate him if she chose him over their dad, especially if their dad were begging to take her back. At Christmas dinner, like they'd ever forget that. Every child wanted their parents to stay together. I just want to say that Zayden and I had the same thing happen as Graham and Grandpap. The car mix-up opened my eyes, too, and I realized that there had been someone here all along who had supported me and taking care of my kids. She laughed. <laughs> and my car. She touched one finger to the pearl necklace. Please don't take this badly, Ken. But Sherry is the one you need to be trying to work things out with. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this was meant for her anyway. Ken's cheeks reddened and he sat down without saying anything. Blythe continued to stand. Zayden and I are together. Shock ripped through Zayden's chest. He hadn't expected her to just blurt it out like that. He couldn't keep the supersized smile off his face. Zayden's going to be our dad now? Lottie asked in a small voice. No, Ken said shortly. Not exactly. Blythe shifted, then slowly sank down into her chair. 
I'm going to marry your mother as soon as she decides she wants me to, Zayden said in the most conversational tone he could manage. New Year's Eve, Graham said, slapping a hand down on the table. Um, that might be just a little too soon, Blythe said. Her cheeks turned pink, which made Zayden's smile even bigger. Not for me. Zayden stared at her. She finally looked up and met his eyes. He'd been waiting years. He'd wait longer, until she was sure, but he didn't need any more time to know who and what he wanted. He pushed back away from the table and walked around. Setting his hand on the back of her chair, he leaned over it, whispering in her ear, Thank you. She pushed back, putting her napkin beside her plate. Excuse us for a moment. Taking his hand, she led him into the kitchen, away from prying ears and eyes. The door had barely shut behind him before she turned. I love you. His mouth hung open. Pretty much every minute I've been here today, you've shocked me somehow. He cleared his throat. <laughs> Never thought I'd hear you say it. She smiled. I love you. I love you too. New Year's Eve might be too soon for me. Whenever. He slid his arms around her and smiled down into her eyes. Bring your car to the shop next week, and I'll see if I can't get it mixed up with the car of someone who lives in Vegas. Her eyes widened. You didn't do that on purpose. If I'd have thought of it, I most definitely would have. Especially if I'd have known that it would get me to right here, today. Merry Christmas, Blythe. His head lowered. Merry Christmas, Zayden. She tilted her head, and their lips met. Hi, this is Jay, and thanks for listening. If you're ready for another great audiobook, here's one we think you might like. Or check out the playlist with all our latest releases. Don't forget to subscribe to Say With Jay, give this video a thumbs up, and tell us what you liked in the comments.